Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's launch for two books on the artist Hilma of Clint. My name is Alethea Rockwell and I'm the Keith Herring Director of Education and Public Engagement here at the New Museum. It's great to have so many people here tonight. I'm so grateful for you all to be here. And as we're gathering now on unceded Lenape land, I'd like to begin by paying our respect to them and to Lenape elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. So tonight, we're celebrating two books, Hilma of Clint, a biography published by the University of Chicago Press in 2022 and Hilma of Clint, Tree of Knowledge, published by David Zwerner Books in 2023. So we're really pleased to have Julia Voss here with us tonight. She's an art critic, an art historian, curator, and the author of the Hilma of Clint, Clint biography, as well as a contributor to Tree of Knowledge. Julia is the curator for the German Historical Museum in Berlin, and she's currently curating the exhibition Hilma of Klint and Vasily Kandinsky, Dreams of the Future, which will open in 2024 at Kunstsammlung NRW in Dusseldorf. Did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Julia is joined in conversation by David Max Horvitz, who is an art historian and assistant curator at the Guggenheim Museum. There, he worked closely with senior curator Tracy Bashkoff on the 2018-19 exhibition, Hilma of Klim Klint, Paintings for the Future. And Tracy herself planned to be here tonight, but there were some unforeseen circumstances and she wasn't able to come. So we're really grateful to David for stepping in and joining us. So this conversation will be moderated by the New Museum's own Massimiliano Gioni, our Edlis Nissen Artistic Director. And tonight is especially meaningful for us uh, because the New Museum and Massimiliano in particular has a significant history with Hilma of Klint. Massimiliano included of Klint in his 2013 Venice Biennale, the Encyclopedic Palace. And again, in 2016, he included a series of her paintings in his new museum exhibition, The Keeper. And that was the first time her work had been shown in New York City in more than a decade. So these three will be in conversation for about an hour, and then we will open up to questions from all of you. And if you didn't get a chance to get your books in advance, they will also be for sale upstairs in the store after the program, so you can get them afterwards. Uh, before we get started, I have some quick thank yous. I'd like to thank the New Museum team that makes these programs happen, in particular, Ginny Haw, Austin D. Bowes, and Derek Wright. And I'd like to thank David Zwerner Books for co-sponsoring this program. I'm also grateful to the Bowery Council of the New Museum for its support of education and public engagement programs. And thank you to our members and supporters like all of you who make these programs possible. So with that, it's a great pleasure to pass things over to Massimiliano. Thank you, Alethea, and thank you everybody for being here tonight, and thank you to David and Julia, and uh, Julia is undoubtedly, I think, the foremost expert on uh, Irma Klint, no pressure, <laughs> so uh, it's really a treat to, to have her here, uh, she literally arrived yesterday, straight from the Irma Klint uh, Piet Mondrian show that opened at eight, um, two nights ago, and so maybe we'll also hear a little bit uh, about that exhibition and also the plans for your future exhibition about Kandinsky and Ilmaf Klint. Um, I want to start with a very perhaps superficial and, and journalistic question, which is after having written this great biography on Ilmaf Klint and having written many other essays, I'm curious if you have an idea of what type of person Ilma was. Um, and I know you dedicated an entire book to, to explain it, it but if you were to, to just draft a quick portrait, or how do you imagine it at this point? Yeah. Um, well, I guess she was a revolutionary mystic. She was a queer futurist. She was um, as stubborn and bold as she was um, uh, modest and playful. Um, and she was one of the most original and surprising painters of the 20th century, I guess. And um, what's really nice, or what really sort of keeps on, um, or what really makes me think is the fact that she 
sort of, she was really someone who thought in beginnings. Um, and so when I started researching her, I had I knew, you know, she did these wonderful paintings starting in 1906, but I was really surprised to see that this kind of process of starting over new didn't stop. I mean, she was about 44 when she started her 1906 endeavor with, um, yeah, inventing new styles with every series. But this kind of, yeah, pleasure in making things up and starting new in sort of transformation never stopped. And she also did that when she was 70. She had then, um, she, there, there was a point where she stopped painting in oil um, and she switched to another medium, which was also because she had problems with, uh, how do you call that? How, with arthritis? The, yeah, arthritis. Um, but that's the fascinating thing, that even in her 70s, she wouldn't stop sort of doing new things and trying out new things. And how did you encounter her work and how did you start working on the biography particularly? Um, I encountered her work for the first time in 2008. I was back then. I was still a journalist. I was working for the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which is a German daily, um, and I was in Stockholm in order to cover uh, an exhibition of the Moderne Musée. And then there was Iris Müller-Westermann, who would also the curator would also do the big 2013 Hilma af Klint show, pioneer of abstraction. And she had two Hilma of Klintz on loan. And she took me through the museums and I went into this room. I was like, oh God, what, what is this? You know, I can't, I can't categorize it. I don't know what, what is it, where does it come from? What time is it? Um, and then Iris um, kindly told me everything she knew about her. And I kind of left with joy and also with anger because I thought, how could that be? How could you know, a work like that be buried by art history in so many layers and not be known and not be seen anymore. So this kind of double feeling with joy and anger, um, that's that, that inspired me to write a series, actually, of articles in Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. And then I was invited to an Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin in 2016 and was supposed to be a sabbatical from the newspaper work. And then that was the first time when I went to the archive in Stockholm to study it myself. And then I was completely, I mean, that was the bait and I sort of was hooked and I was completely drawn into it. And then I decided to go back into academia, write her biography and yeah, start over new. And how long did it take to, to write the biography? So the first time I was in the archive and really thought, oh, wow, you know, this is an unknown life that needs to be told, was in early 2017 and then came out in German in 2020. So it was three years. And in, in, an, in the States, it came out just now in, yeah. in the fall. Um, <clears throat> the, the biography, it's quite remarkable, I think, for two, among many other reasons. One is um, the context in which you place Ilma Klein from when she goes to school and you retrace uh, the influence of other thinkers and, uh, and, and kind of uh, sketch also a, um, a landscape, a social landscape in which Ilma Klintz works and you do that over and over again. But most remarkably, I think it's uh, um, confronting certain myths around Ilma Klintz, which in a sense have uh, um, increased the fascination around her work and uh, myths that I'm also maybe partially responsible for spreading, <laughs> you know, the sense that she's a isolated genius or, or uh, you know, this notion of uh, um, hiding the work, so to speak, uh, and, uh, and obviously her relationship with occultism and uh, spiritism. Um, I think you um, confront many of these um, topics and uh, would you be able even just very quickly to, to sort of set out what were the myths or what were the what was the knowledge that was there about her when you entered the dialogue and and how did you try to to address it yeah i mean what we all thought is that she never exhibited her paintings during lifetime and that's not true um i mean she would have liked to exhibit them much more um, and I think she was kind of disappointed with the um, reception she got. And that's also why she decided when she was almost 70 that her contemporaries shouldn't have the last word and that she should dedicate her works to the future and they shouldn't be seen for 20 years after her death. Um, so that's something that came late in life and wasn't initially the plan. She was very inventive with trying out ways to find an audience. I mean, she tried to exhibit them, um, and she also did 
for example, in London, um, and she and she yeah did something which I call the museum in a suitcase. She did small reproductions of her work, which she glued into blue books, um, and it was always a photograph and a miniature um, watercolor. Beautiful, you had them in the show. There absolutely stunning. And with those, she would travel. And we know that even in Amsterdam, she would she would give them to friends and they would be circulated. So that was a way of her to showing the world what she has done. She, I think she also thought of herself as a writer. So there are certain notebooks that are really notebooks, something that is kind of private. Um, but there are other notebooks that are that really have a title page with her name and sort of, she says, translated into German by Thomasine Anderson and so forth. So there were many different ways in which she reached out um, to the public. Um, so that's one thing. She was not isolated. In fact, she was never alone. I mean, that's something also very important. Um, she was always surrounded by friends. She, we all know about the group of the five, but they kind of dissolved around 1907, 1908, and then a new group sort of built up with 13 women. And dissolved again, it's a bit like in radioactivity where things sort of, the atoms sort of fall in pieces. Um, but she, is, she always had some very close friends, female friends, often lovers around her. Um, and the other thing, I guess, is the relation to Steiner, that the, the idea was that he sort of criticized her severely and that sort of um, made her depressed and she stopped painting for four years. Also, that is not something you can find in the archive. Actually, I think she, I mean, she had a very bold idea. Her idea was really to go to Dornach and have her work displayed in the Goetheanum in Dornach, which was the big center for anthroposophy that Rudolf Steiner had built. And Steiner wouldn't say yes to that, which I think is still something else from criticizing her severely. Um, but he sort of kept her at a distance. Um, and he, but he also, he left commentaries on her work there in the uh, Zwirner book that we also published one of the little notes he left where he talks about sort of the duality of the sexes. Um, so he was kind of interested, but he was not totally taken by it. He was never a fan. So that's also something that's... Um, in, uh, in your contribution to the Zwirner book and in your biography, um, in a sense, you most explicitly describe her and her matriarchal communities in, in queer terms as they would be described today, and you just refer to her as a queer futurist. Um, that to me was one of the, the in a sense, most original um, uh, revelations, yeah. or I think the one about which I learned a lot, and, and so I'm, I don't know how many of you have read already the biography, but I think it would be interesting if you could um, reconstruct also that uh, not to dwell in her private life, but because yeah. obviously um, th the way in which she inhabited her gender in, in that very crucial time, I think it's uh, it's very important. Yeah, I mean, this is also something I thought about a lot because it's I think it's very clear in the paintings that you have a lot of erotic illusions and they're sort of things that look like sexual organs or like physical acts like inseminating or, you know, mating and so forth. And I always wondered, is that, is that a parallel world? Is that something that that is in the paintings because it can't be lived? Or is it in the paintings because it's also in her life? Um, and also in the notebooks, you find a lot of things where it's not quite clear whether it's sort of metaphorical. You also find that there are tensions in the group because it appears not everybody is happy with that. Um, um, and there is one notebook which was um, which is in the archive, and I think this is also extraordinary. I mean, Hilma Afklin curated that kind of archive for us. She was aware that people would look at it, um, together with Anna Kassel, and they would actually they would destroy original notebooks and rewrite them um, or copy them for us. Um, and there is one notebook, and I you know I assume she wanted us to find it. Uh, which is not by her. There are several notebooks that are by other women of the group, or the various groups. Um, and um, this is by a gymnastics teacher, so a physical person, um, Sigrid Lansen, and she explicitly... Nomen, no, nomen, no? Sigrid? Lansen, yeah. yeah. So her name is Sigrid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 right. In yeah, 
Yeah, secret, secret, yeah. And yeah, but she's not so secretive, one has to say. She <laughs> um, she write, she also lives with Hilma Afklint and her mother. She rents um, a room in the apartment. And she writes about sort of that, that they share a bed and that they share a room and they, they kiss and they hug and they see, you know, raining flowers together and so forth. So she is... Um, from that, it's clear it was also a physical relation. And I think ever since I read that, I thought it, that a lot of things in the paintings, you know, are also more um, representational, maybe, than we thought. Um, well, I was just going to say, in. yeah, in addition <laughs> to uh, talking about her sexuality in the book, the kind of, um, there's almost a sense of a kind of like proto-gender queerness that comes up and there's so much imagery in the paintings that does have uh, bodily connotations, sexual connotations, and very often it uh, is kind of like a kind of, to use this terms like a kind of heterosexual imagery, and then to read that she associated herself with all of those things that she aligned yeah. with maleness was also this fascinating, I think, way of opening up how I understand the paintings. So I think that in this case, you know, like these aspects of her of her life, of herself, are really manifest in the work. And I think it does kind of open up new possible readings into what's happening yeah. within the works. I, th I was really, I, I when I was reading the book, I was really taken with that. I thought it was a fantastic discovery. Yeah, I mean, it's, she, she I think an entire circle, they all believe in incarnations. And she, um, wait, I go to one of the pictures where you see it. Uh, There are many. I brought many. Ah. But for example, here. Um, I don't know whether it can be read, but here you see it's written Vestal Asket, which is a strange name and something she made up. But it's sort of, it's the alter ego, her alter ego, and Anna Castle's, her friends, and also painter alter ego. Um, Anna Castle is Vestal, like which, the, like the priestesses that, um, that are on the um, Temple of the Vestal. Um, and Alma of Clint is the male counterpart called Ascot. And it's also a double relation to the temple. I mean, these belong to the temple uh, temple paintings. Um, and the Vestal is someone who sort of secures the temple from outside. And Ascot is the one that turns the own body into a vessel for, you know, some godly inspiration and becomes the temple himself, herself. Um, and Hilma Afklint often has um, male alter egos. Also St. George comes up. Um, and that's fascinating to see that they have this, that they play with this gender um, in, you know, from outside one would say sort of traditionally it's two women, but they conceive of themselves as male and female themselves and, you know, have all kind of double, triple identities. Uh, this will sound polemical, but it's not, um, or it is a little bit. But, <laughs> you know, uh, with Ilma of Clint, we have a, a clear example of uh, uh, a life and a body of work that, in a sense, gets reinterpreted from the perspective yeah. of the future. Even the titles, uh, the, there are no more available titles with the word future uh, referring to, to Ilma of Clint. <laughs> and um, I'm curious if you have any thought as to why... Um, first of all, why the reception has been so, and, and we'll come to you, David, also in the exhibition at the Guggenheim, so exceptional. Um, you know, Umberto Eco used to say, a, a work becomes a cult when it's somehow a weaker text that allows for multiple interpretations and, uh, um, and lacks a clear direction, in a sense, of reading. And, and so that, in a sense, amplifies its reception because anybody comes to it uh, with their own, uh, um, you know, a, a weaker message in a sense uh, uh, creates confusion and hence participation. I'm not suggesting that the work is weak in, in any way, but I'm curious if you have any thought as to what contributes also to this uh, myth or mystique or... Um, yeah, I mean, clearly Hilma Afklint and her work is a building with many entrances. 
Um, and I think there's spirituality, which, you know, for a long time was something that weakened her work in the sense that people wouldn't want to talk about it because of that and that she was excluded from the canon because of that spirituality, because people, you know, found that kind of weird. And now we live, you know, in these Harry Potter days where kind of mag magical thinking is everywhere. Um, and we are fine with it. Everybody does yoga. The kids read Harry Potter and it's suddenly it's fine. Um, and we invade other countries. <laughs> And um, and then I think also in terms of gender c questions, it's such a relief. I mean, you know, we are talking about Picasso all the time and how somehow sort of his personality almost ruins um, the joy of looking at his work. Um, and here we have someone who really, I mean, who talked about transformation and really transformed her own life completely and was able in times where the church, science, society, art, all of them and tried to sort of put women down and tell them how to do it, who, I don't know, magically managed to escape or not even escape, to sort of establish something else. And I think that kind of success, which wasn't a success in, you know, no commercial success, no reputational success, no hierarchical success, but a kind of success in individual freedom. I think this is something that, that is strongly admired today. And David, as uh, having worked on the exhibition at the Guggenheim, I'm curious about, in a sense, your day-to-day -day perception also of what it was an exceptional success and what do you think people projected or brought or found in the exhibition? And I don't mean this in any disparative term, but as we know, it, it became something uh, different in a sense. No, it became a, a popular, event. Yeah, when we were planning the exhibition, uh, there wasn't a sense that it was going to be so popular. Um, I think Tracy um, and I really believed in it. And of course, you know, uh, I got on the calendar. So all of the management at the museum also came to believe in it. But there wasn't this kind of anticipation of the crowds that would draw of the depth of interest. We thought people didn't really know her name, that kind of lack of name recognition would that there weren't so many people at the door, but I think we benefited from a number of things. I think you helped primed New York City with the Keeper, showed some of the works. We benefited so much from Julia's insights throughout. She was really, I would say, a thought partner as we were working on that show. Um, but I think that there is so much about the story that really draws people in. I think, first of all, there's something very romantic about someone could be so dedicated to a project and not have that kind of recognition during life, but have it be something that was really special. I think that people are really drawn to that narrative and it makes for something exciting. It makes it to feel like you're discovering something. Of course, you know, when we're in museums, um, even as kind of art historians, you have the same thought as many other people standing in the same spot, but that feeling of discovery is such a wonderful part about seeing art. And I feel like because of the way that her art came forward, it really gave that in this very, very intense way. I also do think there was this wonderful hunger for the kind of spiritual that um, almost seemed like it was cresting in 2018 in a way that couldn't have been anticipated. I mean, Tracy was thinking about doing that show from, I don't know, 2011 or something like this. It took a very long time to get on the calendar um, and trying to find its place, you know, all the mechanics of figuring out what goes where, which is harder in the Guggenheim um, because of the space. Um, but, um, oh, yes, you know, I felt like there was so much discussion of, like, witchiness and tarot, and it was just, like, all over the Internet. And I feel like people then had this kind of very spiritually motivated work that they could come and engage with on those levels. And, Julia, I mean, the idea that it is a house with many entry points, I think, is absolutely true. And I think also, you know, what you pointed to, that kind of hunger to see who has been excluded from art history, where these great artists, uh, women, people of color, are and that have not been counted because of, you know, just the circumstances of their identity. And I think that there was so much excitement to see that and to see it as a kind of, in such dramatic fashion as being before these big yeah. names that we know. Um, but then to go back to one of the myths that kind of continues is this continued idea of firstness, right? You know, like people still want to say that she's the first, like you'll still see that in little articles online. And I think that one of the things that that 
kind of show and just the any show of this work, any kind of exposure to it, is to disabuse us of the notion that you can really pin down a first in that kind of way. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll talk about that. Yeah. Well, uh, now to play on words, actually, the Guggenheim and the temple that, that uh, Ilma of Clint imagined uh, are not houses of many doors, but <laughs> they were both spiral buildings. And in your chapter, you you draw, uh, sorry, in your biography, you draw a, a very interesting comparison between the development of the Guggenheim and its own origins and what Ilma of Clint was imagining too. And um, to me, it's always been interesting because it, it, in fact, Ilma Clint is one of the many artists that imagine her personal museum, which is something that we're always curious also when, when working on shows here at the new museum and inviting artists to rethink what museums can be. So I don't know if you, uh, well, from the inside of the Guggenheim, if you want to tell us how and if you fleshed out that correspondence, and then maybe, Julia, if you can tell us a little more about what you discovered. Um, yeah, definitely. So um, we had this Maybe kind of... tell a little bit about what the temple was and... Thank you for the prompt. Um, so uh, thanks to, really, I, I feel like to your research, we discovered that um, the specific idea for the architecture of this temple that Helmhoff Clint eventually came to want to realize for the paintings as um, a way to encounter them, to experience them, to experience them in their um, kind of fullest unadulterated power was a series of stacked ring connected by a spiral pathway, which isn't exactly the architecture of the Guggenheim, but it's pretty close. It's pretty, pretty good. Um, and there are kind of deeper connections. It's this kind of wonderful superficial connection that I think really helped make the paintings sing in the space wonderfully. But, you know, the museum was founded uh, by Solomon Guggenheim, but the first director, Hilla Ribe, really set us on the path that we have. And she was deeply invested in spiritually minded, transformative abstraction. That was where her heart was, where her mind was. That was where she focused all of her energies. She was very uh, invested in the thinking of Kandinsky. And there's so many parallels in the kind of ideas, which you do a wonderful job going over in your book, um, between the thinking of Kandinsky and Hamothkin's thinking. Um, and so there's ways where, you know, um, when this building was commissioned, Hilary Bay asked Frank Lloyd Wright to build a temple of the spirit. And I feel like that idea, that kind of sense of wanting that kind of transformative power, that kind of spiritual experience in front of art really dovetail very, very well. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Hilary Bay was obviously in the better place to make this vision happen. Hilary von Riebe was sort of toying with this idea already in the 30s, which I learned from the Tracy Bashkov's essay. Um, she was toying with that idea also in the 30s, and it's really interesting because Hilma af Klint in Sweden had this sort of, was sketch, this sketch here, that that's the early 30s, and she had also the idea that it should be built on an island. Manhattan is an island. Wien is an island. She sort of designed it for an island in between Denmark and um, in Sweden, where a famous um, astronomer had his um, observatory also. Um, and sort of Europe was about to have another world war. Um, Hilma Afton didn't have a sponsor. Hilary Bay had Guggenheim and no world war. So she made this vision happen, happen whereas Hilma Afton sort of did a lot of sketches, beautiful ideas for her museum to show what lies behind the forces of matter. But I think this is something that um, Hilary Riva would also su subscribe to. Well, this is maybe an interesting segue to also the exhibition that opened in London the other day, which I haven't seen. Uh, but it is a, 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 an opportunity to maybe think of Ilma Klint in the context of spiritualistic or, or spiritism culture at the beginning of the 20th century in uh, uh, in Europe mainly you know we 
have learned through a kind of certain history of modernism. Um, you know, we, we have learned about Kandinsky spiritual in art. We know that Mondrian was very much interested, but uh, those are usually seen as um, a kind of blip on their signal, uh, a, you know, maybe a mistake of their youth, and yeah. then it goes on to, to a much more grandiose uh, and, and pure and, and sort of uh, independent um, investigation of art. But could you tell us, and you do that also in the book, you know, how much more porous also those words were um, for Mondrian, not obviously for Kandinsky, for Hilma herself, and, and, and maybe what distinguished her understanding of spiritism or, or the occult in relation to theirs, and whether yeah. that's also investigated in the show in London or not. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's really interesting because a lot of things that we perceive as strength today were seen as weaknesses for a long time. As you said, this whole spiritualism was something, I mean, if you read Adorno, and from the left to the right, all despise spiritualism. Um, and so... I'm getting to the point that maybe I dislike it a little too. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, you know, there is the wishy-washy, everybody loves each other. We talk to speak, you know, the, the Adorno argument is, is sometimes very. Yeah, yeah, he speaks very funny about it, sort of, yeah, with sort of, yeah, with the, the, the something. With, the old it, uh, aunt. And, uh, grandmother's yeah. greetings or whatever, yeah. Um, so nobody liked that. Um, and sort of uh, art history saved Kandinsky and Mondrian from that. Um, and then came Hima of Klint, and it was like she was about to spoil the entire story. And I think. Um, it was also that, you know, she is a planet. She's not just some satellite that goes with a, a lot. Often you can say, oh, there was Impressionism and there were also female Impressionist painters and there was Expressionism and there were female Expressionist painters and they are kind of added to that story. Um, and the peak of Western art history in the Cold War was abstraction and was completely built around these three men, Kandinsky, Mondrian, um, and Malevich, and it had a date, and it had sort of values, and suddenly Hima Afkin came and sort of like a meteorite crashed into that story, and she's a complete planet, you know, you can't just add her, she spoils everything. Um, and I think for a long time that was seen as like, oh, you know, let's keep her out. And now that she's there, everybody, now a lot of people embrace it. And they think, oh, maybe we should sort of rethink Kandinsky and maybe we should rethink Mondrian. And I'm no special, I mean, Kandinsky, I sort of work myself more and more into it, but I'm no specialist on Mondrian. But it's very clear that he was also interested in theosophy. He also unsuccessfully tried to, to win Steiner over for his work. Um, and uh, But there is also a clear difference because none of them claimed to hear voices. Um, and was not in touch with sort of spirits that would guide the work. And that's also something in the beginning I thought, oh gosh, you know, here we have a woman um, who does beautiful, grand, fantastic paintings, and now we have sort of voices from above that commission her to do it. I was kind of underwhelmed by that in the beginning. Um, but the more I read it, and it's, that was the reason why I learned Swedish for that, um, the more I read it, the more I understood it's not... It's not, you know, it's not taking orders, it's a dialogue. And these voices, and that's also true for, I always mis mispronounce her, Georgiana Houghton? Yeah. Georgiana Houghton, in the 19th century. They're very playful, and they're more like invisible friends than kind of, you know, master gods that tell you what to do. And there's an entire beauty in that, that she has these voices that talk to her and actually even applaud her and say you know, what you have done is even better than we thought. And, you know, if you understood how great it is, you would kneel down. Um, and they are always, you know, society, church, science, everybody just goes like, oh God, you know, and even in her, in her close environments, there's criticism. Um, but there are these voices and they are always over the top and they never, they never insist. I mean, they go like, would you like to do this? And then in the beginning she says, yes, of course. Um, but later on she would also say, I'm not sure, you know, I'm old, I feel weak, I feel, you know, I don't feel strong enough. And then they don't insist, they sort of, like, playing children, come, they come back later with another idea. And I have to say, I really like those voices. Yeah. voices. Um, <laughs> I, I love that. Um, the, 
But I think, you know, for the kind of ideas around theosophy and spiritualism and these other belief systems that were so formative to so many of the modernist artists, there are things that are motivating their thinking, there are things that they want to make manifest in their painting, the things that I think are integral to the effect of their painting, but it's never as strong as what Hilma Hofkland wants, you know? And I think the those times where she tried to show her work, she was really looking for an audience of like-minded viewers, not a kind of audience of modern art um, yeah. spectators. Yeah. Um, she really was looking for something distinct and she knew about that other world like you know we know that she was a trained artist so she was showing that she was deeply aware of what was going on she chose not to engage in that world and one of the things that I actually found a little detail it's actually I, it was actually in the quote there but oh, okay. about the book was that she talks about a museum for the work because I had always thought about it as a more explicitly religious and in a, in a kind of narrow sense like to use so to use the word religious rather than spiritual yeah. um, project and that to me her use of that word was so fascinating because I had always thought of her as not seeking out that world which almost felt like this uh, slight perversion of showing the work in a museum context that in some way it was going against this kind of base wish that she had, although I also feel so deeply that it has to be seen and has to be in that context. Um, but there is, I always felt this little bit of friction. And then reading that word museum in her quotes over and over again really kind of opened up my thinking. It was a little reassuring. Yeah, uh, yeah it alternates. She, gets, she talks of a temple and she talks of a museum. It's both there. This I also found interesting that um and i'm sure i mean for example kandinsky came to stockholm in 1916 because of revolution in russia and because of the world war and he had to leave germany um, and i'm pretty sure she must have heard seen what was going on i mean he was all over in the papers and um yeah but she chooses not to write this uh, about this in her notebooks and um is there any evidence of uh, knowledge of the work of Mondrian, or how is that presented in in the Tate Show? Sorry to, I know you didn't work on the Tate Show, but yeah. I'm curious um, if you have a take since you're the first emissary. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, no. They um, it says very clearly that also they that didn't. It, it's clear that they, or relatively clear, that they didn't meet. Um, Hilma Afton was in Amsterdam. Um, but there is no sort of personal connection. And I, Mondrian is also a name you wouldn't find in her notebooks. You find Kandinsky, but you find him... Because of the spiritual in art or... Uh... Actually, it's, she misspells him. <laughs> I still do, so don't blame <laughs> It is, everybody does. That's so difficult to, to, chart, uh, to find him in newspaper articles because usually they sort of misspell him. You have to try every kind of combination of letters that sounds like yeah. Kandinsky. But she writes also Kandinsky as if someone had told her and she would take down a note. And so she writes Kandinsky walking in color, as if this is like something she should check out. And this is <laughs> the 1920s, right? So she's already done yeah. the paintings for the temple. Yeah. yeah, that's actually that's in her Amsterdam notebook. Yeah. And so you are working now on a show on Kandinsky and uh, and in Math Clint. Can you say a little bit and and also tell us maybe a little bit about the the Mondrian uh, can in Math Clint, which has been um, reviewed today in the Guardian with a review that seems to go back to the Hilton Kramer, um, yeah. New York Times. You should explain what the Hilton Kramer... Well, the Hilton Kramer, which is particularly interesting with Mondrian. You know, I remember as a kid, the first time I saw Mondrian, I was so uh, surprised by actually how the surface and the quality of the paint was somewhat irrelevant. And sorry, now I'll be stoned or, or thrown tomatoes. But, you know, <laughs> no, but it was a great revelation that for him it was such a matter of intellect at one point... And particularly, you know, if you know the paintings, which are not even paintings, there were still studies with the scotch tape and so on, that the painting treatment was almost mere execution, you know? Like, uh, um, I had always assumed through the photographs that um, they would have a, a quality of being somewhat untouched or, uh, or objective. 
object-like, and when you see them, instead they have a fragility and they have a, um, a, a, a tactile quality. Yeah. They completely surprise me, yeah. no? And, um, and so the Hilton Kramer, in a sense, dismisses uh, Ilma Flint on the basis that they look like diagrams. Yeah sort of something like colored yeah, diagrams. and they're not paintings. And I find it's a very interesting accusation because on many levels you could say that Mondrian at one point looked like diagrams and are even executed as such. You know, yeah. there, there is a um, almost a utilitarian quality to what what is making in, in certain paintings. And uh, uh, and now I don't remember the gentleman who just reviewed the Mondrian uh, um for sure, I don't remember. In the Guardian, yeah, I forgot. Uh, but anyway, the accusation is basically she cannot paint uh, unlike him, who, who is a master painter. And, yeah, he uh, calls her pedantic, I remember. Yeah, pedantic, and, and basically says the only argument that you can make after seeing the show is that he was a giant and she was somewhat um, an, an outsider artist of yeah. sorts. Um, so I'm curious if and how that perception plays out to you, you've seen it, and I don't know, David, you were just about to add something, I think. Oh, I was just going to say the Hilton Kramer review is from 1986, from the first time the paintings were shown in a museum context um, at LACMA, Maurice Tuckman's A Spiritual in Art Show, and so it really is quite the, quite the throwback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you also, Hilton Kramer made the ridiculous argument that she would only get attention because she is a woman, she's only successful because she is a woman, and you think, hold on, is it Women in art history are particularly successful. <laughs> anyway, but sort of claims go all over the place. So, um, with... I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but what's your take on the show in London? Or um, they... And what is, do you think there is an argument there for, for I mean, that dialogue? So, um, I, I think as much as you can see the similarities, I mean, they both come from landscape painting, they're both interested in also in flower painting, and then they, at some point, they get abstract. And, and, as, as, and they were interested in theosophy, and they were interested in, in Steiner, and so forth. As much as they have a lot of similarities, I think you can see also a lot of differences. And I, you know, for me, it plays out against Mondrian, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I have the feeling you see that he's, you know, although in kind of formal terms, he's, I mean, for sure, he's interesting and tries a lot and he does, he comes up with great paintings, no question. But I think you can also see that he sticks pretty much to a kind of symbolist world with sort of nude, but particularly there is a triptych which is called evolution. And that's basically it's three nude uh, female bodies symbolizing evolution and sort of awakening and spiritual awakening um, and it's a, it's it's a very much it's a male 1900 turn of the century world um, and also when he does what's the flower again he spoke about it uh, carnation carnation um, you can see he's interested in the flower as a symbol um, and that's how he does it and Hilma Afkind is interested in the particular flower um, and how you know how it connects with the earth, how it connects with the, the with the, the larger the the macrocosm and so forth. So they are also they are very different, and I guess it's a term. It, it's a bit you know whether you form more to the one the one side or the other side is also a bit sort of depends on what you're interested in. I can see there are a lot of differences. I, you know I think there's no need to play out these artists against uh, each other and. But I think also in a way it's it's clear on the one hand everybody sort of pretends we are over it now and you know now and Katie Hessel is here and we have a lot of artists now female artists in the canon but if you look in the actual collections and so forth the picture is still very different and I think being an artist is still very different for queer people for uh, female people or whatever you identify or however you identify. So in a way, it's good. It's printed again, and um, you know, it's there, and it has manifested itself. I think one of the things to me that's so interesting about Hamafklin, as opposed to Mondrian or Kandinsky or Malevich or any of these uh, kind of major mainstream modernists, is that she doesn't seem devoted to abstraction as such. She uses it as a kind of communicative and expressive tool 
that she combines with all kinds of figurative imagery, with all kinds of symbolism, in this very complicated amalgamation that I think makes the paintings endlessly fascinating, as opposed to these other figures where they really slowly kind of wade toward an abstraction and then become very devoted to it in a way that feels much more linear, much more about a kind of progress, much more about finding a kind of absolute answer, where she kind of, to me, is like always looking for tools to get across ideas, to get across feelings, that I think makes the work feel in some way much more contemporary. Um, you know, there's a way that I think encountering these paintings over the last, I don't know, decade or so, um, where they feel like they could have been made yesterday in some sense. And I don't think it's just because they look unfamiliar. I think it is because they're functioning a little bit differently than in, but substantially uh, differently than those other artists work in ways that I think feel truer to our own moment. I have the feeling in a way she's she's closer to Kandinsky than she is to um, Mondrian. I mean, also, I mean, Mondrian is, is a city person as far as sort of what I understood. Hilma F. Clint is very much a kind of nature uh, person and she's no, you know, no, yeah. Um, and Kandinsky, I think it's interesting because Kandinsky sort of in also in the 20s complains about that people pay too little attention to the spiritual in his art. This is something he also he talks to the critics and says, like, yeah, the formal is interesting, but you know, how about the spiritual? That's something that is really important for him. And I think, I mean, I think it's very important what you said about the that this is not him often doesn't do absolute paintings. I think this. It's always starting over new. It's not about sort of having one rigid system that is now being replaced by another rigid system, but it's constant evolution. It's constantly starting over new, changing, transforming, connecting, changing through, connecting. I mean, connecting is all over in these pictures. Um, uh, and that's also, that's that's very unique, I guess. But I, I, I probably... I would say I, I have the feeling she's closer to Kandinsky, although in terms of distribution, for example, they had completely different ideas. I mean, Kandinsky would go through galleries and he was um, inventive and um, uh, also very um, strategic in choosing, you know, which museum he approached, which gallery he approached, when he would do a series, how it was printed and how it would circulate and so forth. Um, and as I said, Hilma of Clint also looked for ways of finding an audience, but for her it was always very clear that her paintings, particularly the paintings for the temple, should stay together in one building, which is completely out of this world. It's, a, you know, but, but, but in, um, in the end she succeeded. Yeah, I see that though, particularly because you have the, the ten large, one of the ten largest behind you, uh, which in sheer scale is also quite, Amazing, no? Almost uh, the original scale here on the wall. Yeah, it's yeah. almost the original scale. And if you compare it even to the largest abstract paintings of that moment, uh, this is uh, um, a, almost architectural, which, yeah. you know, to me is always um, made them appear more in dialogue with Art Nouveau, in a sense, or with a kind of uh, uh, total leaving of art, which was what Henry van der Velde was proclaiming, you not know, the idea from, from the kimono to the architecture. And, um, and maybe that's also why she naturally uh, gravitated towards the idea of a temple where everything was together. You know, there is this kind of holistic notion that, um, and you know, the, the two others, and it's not insignificant, were exiled also, uh, you know, Kandinsky. And so they, they kind of had to bring things with them. And they had also a trauma of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, for all the accolades they now get. Yeah. It's not that they had a happy life. No, no, I mean, <laughs> this know, is... And, you know, I mean, one died so poor that they had to, you know, for Mondrian, yeah. uh, pay for his um, tombstone. And, uh, and, and, and of course, I'm not defending them in any way because they don't need defense. But I think that no, no, experience of exile was probably different from... Uh, no. for she lived in a neutral country um, yeah. at a certain moment in time. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think particularly for Kandinsky, it was, you know, he, he was first, 1914, he was expelled from Germany because he was Russian and there was war with Russia. Um, and then he couldn't go back to Russia because of the re revolution. And then he was in Stockholm where he met Gabriel, Gabriele Münter again. And then he would go, he would go to after the war, back to Germany, start the Bauhaus, um, and then again had to leave um, Germany and the Bauhaus, 
um, first Dessau, then, no, first Weimar, then Dessau, and then it was Paris. I mean, he was constantly moving, um, and it was through his writing a lot also that he sort of found a kind of structure that would hold the works um, together. And I, there's also a quote that he dreamt of designing a building that for his uh, paintings, and it's, yeah, out of circumstance that this didn't happen. Your point about these paintings being architecture on scale, I think, is exactly right. But for me, I, I always think about them, you know, if you think about paintings of that scale, during that period, you'd most likely have a history painting, and it would be in a landscape orientation. So even the fact that this is vertical is odd in a way. And I think it actually relates to a kind of very traditional like Renaissance or Baroque church painting. I think that's where you see that orientation, that scale much more frequently. And as you write about, you know, that's what you gravitated toward in her travels. And there's so much kind of Christian iconography that comes through in these paintings, especially in the dove with the kind of when you're seeing St. George and the gold leaf, it looks like it could have come out of a late medieval yeah, and visual that, culture. Um, not to again, you know, project content on her, but there is a proximity with uh, minor arts uh, that I think has made her also um, somewhat more relevant today. You know, because there is a critique of assumptions around what is major and minor art yeah. that, um, in a sense, Mondrian and Kandinsky or anyway, a, another trajectory seemed to be more, uh, you know, it was the picture, it was an easel picture even for... Uh, Although take for the Blaue Reiter yeah. um, and Kandinsky, I mean, they were... No, there was a much wider understanding. Yeah, around. they were particularly interested in folk art. And this is also something we're going to have in, in hopefully, with uh, good loans in the, uh, in the exhibition is, I mean, Hema Aftint was interested in folk art um, and St. George comes up, and St. George is also very prominent in the Blaue Reiter and Kandinsky. I mean, you have, there are many times that uh, Kandinsky, uh, the, the, it's the kind of heraldic um, figure of the Blaue Reiter and particularly of Kandinsky's. Can I ask you a question? I remember correctly, though, you suggest she worked on them horizontally. On yes. the ten yeah, lines. you even yeah. find uh, footprints on the yeah. canvas. Which is also quite unusual no, in the yeah. idea that, that, and somewhat maybe more contemporary. Uh, Where you add this? Oh, just about the craft. Um, th you know, there, I'm blanking on the name, but there was this kind of craft movement that came up in the late 19th century in Sweden. And there was a popular um, home decoration that was made on paper, often with floral patterns. And there are a lot of her works these included, are paper mounted to canvas and have that kind of floral look. You would never confuse one for the other. But I do think that there's so many ways that she's so in attentive to a broad visual culture and synthesizing so much into the work. You know, I think that she's um, actively bringing so much together. I think also film is something that she's thinking about in addition to art history. But I think it's all kind of mediated into something very mediated, good word, um, something very unique. Um, you just say film? Yes. In which way? Was oh, so, um, you know, I think especially some of the, all the series you read one after another, but many of the early ones, you have this kind of episodic quality. But as you get later into the paintings for the temple, there's a way that they, one image almost blends into the next in a kind of logic that's very similar to the film strip. And there was actually, um, in the studio, oh, I lost, oh, uh, in the studio. Ilma, it's intervening. Yeah. She, she, has, she's, she's, she disagrees <laughs> she with me. She does not agree. Yeah. Uh, but there was um, a movie theater in the ground floor of uh, her studio in the early 20th century. And I think that there is this way that I don't think she ever to my knowledge, ever talks about film or going to the movies. She went to the movies. Ah. Yeah, she went to see, this is also, I mean, it's just sort of a jotted line, but she went to see Quo Vadis, which is, you know, sort of about ancient Rome and it's a love story between, I forgot, maybe the princess is enslaved or I should know, but I write it in the book, but I forgot. So it's, uh, she went to the movies and saw Quo Vadis with this secret Lancine and, um, that is the quote I, yeah, um, I brought up about sort of Hilma slept by me um, for a while on the morning of July 25th, kissed me incessantly, held, my, held me 
so oh, held my neck the neck is missing held my neck so tightly that I saw endless white flowers raining down um and just suffocation <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's yeah the um, of the times <laughs> <laughs> And um, I have the feeling, and she writes particularly about this picture that this was inspired by Sigrid. And I have the feeling there you really have this kind of, you know, the darkness of a cinema room and this kind of light coming up. I feel, I feel this is very much sort of a cinema experience. I don't know which movies you watch, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we maybe talk a little bit about Tree of Knowledge yeah. uh, because it's the occasion of, of the new book, the new publication, and a, also a, a significant discovery, which was that this particular series of Tree of Knowledge is in a sense a copy uh, that was found in Dornak uh, at the, um, in the archive. So that also intersects much more closely with Steiner. And, and so maybe if you want to remind us uh, a little bit about how and that cycle um, developed, it, the, the first cycle and its uh, presence then in, um, in Dornak. Yeah, so Tria of Knowledge, she starts it in, um, in summer 1913. She does two pictures, that, I mean, it's always a series, ever since she sort of switched from academic painting to um, that kind of spiritual painting, she would always do a series. It's never a single sort of picture. And also Tree of Knowledge is a series of seven pictures and one detail. Um, and she starts in 1913. That's this one here is one of the first. And she does one more and then she stops and uh, takes it up again, resumes her work on it in 1915 and then finishes it during the war. Um, Sweden is neutral but still you know, it surrounds Sweden and it's um, something she thinks about actually a lot. It's for her work, it's really formative that there is a war. Um, and Tree of Knowledge, I think, is a lot of things at the same time. I think as a series, it's an alchemic process. It's a process of transformation. Um, and it's sort of, it's it, it's the, the dual, the, uh, the dualisms combine and they form one, which is also, I mean, the, the whole trick of the alchemic process is to reunite um, matter and spirit. And that's what's happening here. The sexes are being united um, and matter and spirit is being united. And she sort of takes us through this with in seven stages. And there are a lot of, I mean, there is the, the, the tree that sort of goes with the roots in the earth and the, uh, no, other way around. Roots upwards, leaves downwards of the Bhagavad Gita. There is Yggdrasil in it, the Nordic tree. Um, it could also be, um, it also looks like, like a jellyfish. I mean, it's, it looks like a mushroom. It's something pulsing, it's something transforming. Um, and in the end, it's an upside down story of, you know, the sexes are not thrown out of paradise, but they unite and they stay. Mm -hmm. So it's a reversal of the Christian story of the paradise. It's it's kind of it starts outside paradise and then it takes them to paradise again, where unity is there again. Uh, you mentioned Kandinsky, obviously, and, and the work with the Blau writer and um, sort of folkloric myths and so on. Uh, I was always curious. Do you think Ilma Clint and we have in, in you know I am a um, devourer of books. I was very pleased to see that you have actually a list of books that she owned. Uh, so you have the full library at the time of uh, Ilma Klint's death. Uh, that it's, yeah, uh, I did that with Johan of Klint. Uh, so I was curious, uh, did she have, uh, I don't know what's the English title, I was just looking it up, uh, phrase and book, the, the golden um, branch, or what is it called? Is she on it? Do you know? Which is this sort of comparative, uh, let me see if... Um, I don't think so. Okay. I was just curious about, was she, I mean, what was her attitude towards, let's say, folkloric myths? Was it um, somewhat anthropological and uh, uh, theoretical or was she... Um, I think it's, for her, it's always immersive. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of this Orlando world um, where she enters these narratives. It's never 
taken from a distance. It's like her paintings. It's always immersive. She didn't have it, by the way. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and about how this, right, she did, and th that is the content of um, this oh, no, book. And uh, also, I, I contributed to it, but there is a wonderful um, interview also, for example, by Helen Maltzworth with Joy Harjo, and there are many beautiful contributions in it. So it's, I, I really enjoyed reading that book, um, the David Swinner Hilma of Tree of Knowledge book. And it's, she did of the Tree of Knowledge, it's the only series we know of, of which she did two versions or two copies. Um, and one, they are part of the paintings for the temple. And she, another version was done for um, the Goethe Amen in, in Dornach. So she tried to give it to Steiner and it survived in the archive and it was actually discovered by Halina Dirschka, who did the documentary on Hilma Afkin, Beyond the Visible. She went to the Goetheanum, and she's very insistent. <laughs> um, and she went to, oh, because the Goetheanum has several archives um, there, Steiner archive, uh, Goetheanum archive, um, and then the successor of Steiner, also uh, Albert Steffen archive. And Halina went there and said, do you have anything by Hilma Afkin? And they were like, um, no, maybe we have something by Klimt, Gustav Klimt. And then Halina was like, can I see it? Um, and she looked at it and then saw that yeah, it is this. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's a beautiful, completely untouched, sort of virgin version of the uh, tree of knowledge. And you New Yorkers had the luck to see it here in the David Zuna galleries. Um, and it's now owned uh, by Glenstone, but it was originally there sleeping in the archives. Yeah. When did she, because I went to Dornach, because, you know, in the Venice Biennale we had, I don't remember how many hundreds drawings by Steiner, uh -huh. and uh, it didn't occur really to ask. Uh, <laughs> so I guess a missed opportunity, you know, yeah. the, I guess the, the archive is amazing. Like the, these drawings, you know, Steiner was a compulsive lecture giver. I think he gave more than 5,000 lectures in his life. Yeah, you know, people some, would joke. Sometimes three a day. Yeah, when the, the people were building the Gotenaum, the, the workers say that he would go up to them and give lectures about bees and so on. <laughs> and, um, and not only did that, he made thousands of drawings that were basically his slides, shows for, um, uh, for and they have thousands of those and um, so it didn't occur to me to ask you know it's a place where you don't really think of others that much you yeah. it's like a, a sort of temple to himself and uh, and so it didn't occur to me to ask what else they had there. I think it was sort of when Helena told me about them it's sort of 2014 2015 maybe yeah. that she discovered that so big missed opportunity yeah. <laughs> but you have to be insistent because I know a lot of people were there and asked yeah. and they were all like, no, no, nothing. Well, I can say I asked. Yeah, yeah, you asked, but <laughs> Halina has a way if she wants to get an answer, she gets an answer. I just, you, you, I just went back up a little bit. You said something about Helmhoff Clint's beliefs being uh, immersive and I, I really do believe that she had such deeply held belief. And one of the things I loved about your book, I loved a lot of things about your book, um, but that you really try to engage that on her own terms and that to just kind of let that be as it is in a way that's very unadulterated. You talk about not wanting to have a kind of sociological approach, which I admit I'm absolutely guilty of in my own writing. And <laughs> that's also fine. Yeah, yeah. But um, I would do it again. <laughs> but I loved reading something free of that and also just... Uh, there's so many kind of rich insights in that book. And also it's wonderfully readable. I really flew through it. Thank you, but thank you. <laughs> I think about the immersiveness. This is also something, I mean, the tree of knowledge is, you know, compared to the, now they, are, they have the same size, but tree of knowledge is rather small and the 10 largest are huge. But I think what these two paintings also share is that you look at something that could be a miniature thing or it could be the cosmos. Um, and that means that you as a spectator, you're kind of shrinking and growing. You could be very small or you could be very, you could be a giant. And I think this is something that has an effect on the viewer that you can't sort of, often in paintings you have a feeling of proportion, what size you are and what size it, that is you look at. And here you're not sure anymore. And it sort of shrinks you and enlarges you, which is, 
I think is beautiful and it adds to the immersiveness. And I think the other thing is also not so much here with the tree of knowledge, but often it could be also something seen from, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be in front of you. It could be also something you look down or you look up. And you find the circle often in her compositions. And this, it could be a look through a microscope or it could be a look through a telescope, mm -hmm. which is also something. And with the Tree of Knowledge, there is one passage which, which I think is also decipher for what she did, which is in Steiner, where he talks about he he talks about traveling through his own body's body, traveling through the nerves. Um, and having that kind of experience, and then also at the same time traveling through the universe. And I think this is something that is taking place in the Tree of Knowledge. It's an inward and outward journey through the micro and the macrocosm. And I'm absolutely stunned how she found, I mean, it, we have a lot of associations, but it, this kind of imagery she came up with is completely unique and I'm still you know I look at it and it's like it's beyond words it's just it's such a wonderful invention for something that I didn't know even before it exists and that's I mean that's the strength of her work then I think it's a wonderful um, way to maybe transition to to the audience and see if they have uh, questions yeah. and uh, we we sort of didn't really dwell much on um, so on the um, you know the seances and uh, and the voices from above and maybe I'm sure there will be a few questions about it but um, so if anybody has any questions uh, yeah but we're recording so it would be great if uh, the microphone works but. Okay, yes, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I think this looks like a fantastic um, PowerPoint and I'm wondering if there's any way that we could also get access to that. Oh, to the PowerPoint? Uh, yes. No. Uh, for the right price. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether there are any uh, legal uh, rights, image rights issues. I mean, from my side, Mm. Absolutely. Let's talk after that, and we find a way. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, how is it that Sweden hasn't built a museum for her yet? Uh, I'm not the right person to answer, and I'm sure they're going to build a museum. Uh, well, but one could argue that the absence of the museum has uh, prolonged uh, the reception and the life of the work. You know, there is nothing worse than a one artist museum to, to kill a career. You know, I, I know a few that, um, that perish by yeah. uh, Steiner himself, you know, his own, um, it didn't really help him, I think. You yeah. Know? And he takes the, a kind of um, yeah, Iris Müller-Westermann, who, uh, who was actually with the Monk Museum before, yeah. Iris Müller-Westermann, the curator, curated the wonderful um, Pioneer of Abstraction show, him after the Pioneer of Abstraction in 2013 in the Moderna Museum. She said to me very early, she said, Julia, listen, that it will take a while, but Sweden will understand that Hilma Afklint is to Sweden, but Munk is to Norway. And that's sure. And Norway has just built a giant museum. Yeah. Um, for Monk, I'm sure him often will we'll yeah. get to museum too. And Iris and the Moderna Museet have been so supportive in more recent times of Hilma of Clinton. In the 1960s, they weren't so interested, but you know, over the last couple of decades, I think their support is really substantial and amazing, and um, helps account for the kind of access to work that we that we have today. Because you know, Hilma of Clinton wasn't in the position of some artists to endow a foundation, so. But, uh, I mean, the question also raises another interesting point, which is um, you cannot acquire works from the estate at the moment, right? Um, or anyway, the reception is uh, uh, predicated basically on loans. You know, you have seen there is one at MoMA since the reopening, and it's a long-term loan. I don't remember if uh, Pompidou has one, but, you know, very, sp very limited loans. Um, which pose a, a very interesting question. You know, will uh, Ilmaf Klein remain uh, 
somewhat a myth in itself because it's not in the collections. Um, does the museum help uh, to have them all concentrated in one point or would it help uh, as, you know, fate has helped uh, the Mondrians and Kandinsky because there is one in each German museum or one in each. Uh, so that's also another, you know, is, is the dispersion more uh, um, effective in consolidating somebody's position in the canon of art history than the concentration in one side. I mean, no, that's true. I mean, the, the reception is very extraordinary because she's not on the market, she's not in institutions, and she doesn't have sort of that kind of natural lobby that usually sort of helps to distribute a work and also to support it. Um, the Guggenheim doesn't. It has a loan. No? Ah, Berlin has a loan. The Neue Nationalgalerie has a loan. We, we don't. <laughs> I think you want some drawings, no? Or, uh, no, no, no. I wish, I wish, I, I, I would love. You know, we don't have uh, permanent collection galleries in the same way that many other museums do. And so um, it's, just a, it's just a different situation. But I would. Oh, love because that. they are defined by the um, yeah. like, donation you know, or the. Yeah. No, uh, like, you know, you go to MoMA or you go to the Met and you walk through all their collection galleries one after another. We don't have that same kind of real estate at the museum. And the, the Tannhauser collection is somewhat... Tannhauser collection closed, is right? like... You cannot change, you cannot bring in new things, can you? Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm happy to talk all about the Tannhauser collection afterwards, <laughs> but <laughs> come find me. No, and, and there is now, there is the beautiful, I mean, if one wants to see at least sort of high, the highest quality reproductions, there's also the beautiful Catalogue Raisonné in seven volumes, yeah. um, where you and can Probably an really immersive experience coming to us very soon. Yeah, uh, yes, also, yeah, um, where you can really look through one series after uh, the other. Um, yeah. yeah. I, you know, the question of dispersal, I think, to my mind, there's no question that that would help kind of cement her place in a kind of art historical canon and thereby kind of crack it open. But it is also in some way explicitly against her wish. And so that kind of element of friction that I talked about, you know, the way that I don't think she was seeking out the kind of modern museums, the kind of modern art world that we have. And so to kind of fold her into it, it does some wonderful things for us because I think it cracks open what we do in very productive ways. But for her and for what she would have wanted, it's not quite that. And so there is also this kind of, I think, conundrum about how one presents the work in the kind of avenues we have for presenting that kind of work. Um, and that's not an easy question to, to answer. Yeah, and now I say an, a heretic thing, but I think she was not obsessed with the original. So um, Alex, is it Alex Ross of The New Yorker has written a beautiful article on Hildegard of Bingen, uh, where he said that she was the, she, he called her, which I think is excellent, she was the um, Andy Warhol of a spiritual factory. Um, and in a way, I think this is also true for Hema Afklind. I mean, she also worked, it was a collaborative work. Um, and I think she would have been open to, like Hildegard von Bingen, whose visionaries were illuminated by the nuns and they were also copied, she would have been open to the idea that several series in copies could exist and circulate. We can say that if everything goes according to plan, we'll have Hildegard of Bingen Liber Divinorum at the New Museum in October. Oh, that's, oh wonderful. I envy you. <laughs> well, let's get it here first. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for this presentation. It was uh, fascinating. Um, I'm actually Sharma Ray, and this is Daniel Tegeter, my collaborator. Um, we're Hilma's ghost. So this oh, is great. our, our I know namesake. You from Instagram. Yeah. Great, you're here, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, um, and so, you know, I'm just really enjoying the poetic justice of a gender, potentially gender queer woman blowing apart the modernist canon. Um, I think there's, you know, a, a lot of um, humor in that, irony in that. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, given that some of these difficult, you know, challenges in terms of Hilma of Clint not, say, having a market, and we know how much that has to do with the kind of, um, you know, the, the canon that builds up around an artist's work, uh, and I'm so glad you're doing the show in Dusseldorf and the show that's happening in London, and, and I hope that 
we can go and see those shows as well. And of course, she's being paired up with these uh, major modernist, you know, the men that have had so much scholarship around them already. Um, what do you see as, what would you as a scholar like to see in the future? You know, in terms of what do you see in terms of the scholarship ideally being around Hilma of Clint's work for the long term? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful question. I mean, I'm so obsessed with Hilma of Clint and Kandinsky right now that I'm sort of not really able to think beyond that. But I mean, there's already, there's so much happening you introduced me very kindly as the sort of expert, but there are a lot of experts now, um, and she's been st she's being studied very thoroughly. And um, I mean, one thing that recently was published is also Hilma of Klin's archive doesn't is not only an archive of her work, but also of the women's women around her, and they are being studied. There is. Um, a book on Anna Kassel and her a series she has done um, published. Um, th but there's also another person called Edith, okay, now this is a complicated name, Edith Knaffel Granström. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should find a short form for that. So she has some, um, uh, people can at least sort of pronounce her name. Edith Knaffel Granström is has also left a lot of works in that archive. And she was also a very interesting person who even ran um, an art school in Vienna for a while. And I think studying these women around her is something I'm, you know, I don't know whether how much I can do of that, but I'm very interested to hear about and see developing. Um, you know, Thank you. Uh, one question that I think is, is somewhat returning also in the question around the museum is whether... Um, assimilation is also the way to go. Now, you know, I thought it was amazing to see Ilma F. Clint in the circa 1913 room at MoMA when they reopened, you know, with Sonia Delaunay and Umberto Boccioni and so on. Um, but you know, I'm often reminded, because in a sense I saw her work as a, an outsider when, when I put her in the Biennale. There is a beautiful short text by Thomas Hirschhorn about the Art Brut Museum in Lausanne. And he says, you know, is the way in which we accept the outsider within the canon, does he actually deflate their disruptive? Uh, I mean, unfortunately, you cannot use disruptive anymore because it's a, a Elon Musk. <laughs> you know, the question is, is, is the assimilation within the canon the solution? Or, you know, for him, he uses the metaphor of the stray dogs. Can, he, can the stray dog be remain stray with all its uh, uh, weirdness or does it need to become a chapter in the story? And, uh, you know, Carla Lonzi, the, the great uh, uh, feminist Italian writer, she spoke, she said the woman at one point, she becomes a, a subject to imprevisto, an unforeseen subject. And, um, you know, how can museums have unforeseen subjects? I don't know, I don't have an answer, but I think that would be perhaps also more interesting, you know, that, that she's there um, with all, the ways in which she doesn't fit in, you know, and uh, and how can we preserve that space? And, you know, paradoxically, it should be also maybe the role of museums when it comes to Mondrian, and when it comes to Kandinsky, you know, not to fit them in, uh, but also to preserve the, the very different ways in which uh, they found their way into the museum. And I, I don't have a solution, though, I guess, uh, but it's an yeah, interesting no, challenge. You know? Yeah, it is. Lots of questions. I, I actually have an introduction. I'm, I'm from Zeitgeist Films. I'm Emily Russo. And I distributed Hilma of Clint. And David, we've spoken or communicated. So we distributed the documentary that Helena wouldn't say no. She, we had to take it. She is very insistent. But in fact, I, I, I had seen the show at the Guggenheim, and I was already completely bowled over. So it wasn't really a hard sell. I was like, really? There's a documentary about Hilma of Clint? Send it over. And it was amazing. Um, I love the film. I love you in it. Uh, I think you add so much to the story, and I wanted to just acknowledge that. So I'm here to say hi about that. But also, we were opening the film theatrically in April of 2020. So we never got to open the film in theaters because of the pandemic. And so we did it online. We did a virtual screening thing. It was incredibly successful. It was amazing for that time to have a film that caught on like that. I just, could, like you were surprised about the, it's turnout. We were like, wow. 
a lot of people are watching this online at a you know sort of premium price, like as if it was a theater. We partnered with theaters and we we showed it that way. Yeah. And just to give a little plug, um, in honor of all of these Hilma things happening, including the feature film that just opened, which we don't have anything to do with, but um, the we the Metrograph is going to show the film in May. They're going to actually open it for a little run. So very good. But we'll have a chance to come and and see it then. And when you get to your uh, Hildegard von Bingen, if you do that show, well, we I have Vision is another film that we distributed, which was uh, the Margarita von Trotta? Margarita von Trotta film about <laughs> Hilda. So just saying, well, I'm I'm your woman here, you know. Just call me. We'll we'll do a screening. We'll set up a screening of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very stimulating conversation. Um, it's clear that this is a moment where the spiritual and art has taken a big turn. And the way that you, the, the things that you started to say about Hilma led me to think about one of the challenges that we face at this moment with the spiritual and art, and that is how does the Adorno point of view, the sentimentality about grandmothers separate itself from the very um, rigorous spiritual discipline that uh, Hilma of Klimt engaged in during her life. And um, I think that for me the key that came forward during your talk was the understanding of the immersive, which I could see as the spiritual practice of integrating all aspects of your being so that you could, in effect, evolve your capacity for perception. You would no longer need to look th at things in categorical terms. And I feel like this is a change that her work is challenging us to make. So I would welcome any thoughts or response to that notion. Oh, that's already beautifully said. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree, agree. And you put it down beautifully. So thank you. Hi. Um, we've talked a lot tonight about the need for um, multiple art histories oh, instead of just one singular art history. And the way that you described Hilma as a planet of her own volition and her own being, I think, is a really apt way to kind of divorce her from these ideas of Mondrian and Kandinsky. And I'm just kind of wondering, is there a way that we can think about her without using these like unquote forefathers of abstraction as a reference point like how how can we think about her it in terms of her own world it, and if, is that even possible with you know the way that we've considered art history up until this point I know that's basically an impossible question but no it's a very good question um and I think this is being done I mean in in the um Ilma of Clint got rediscovered and then the canon was shaken, but also, for example, Georgiana Houghton then was brought in. Um, we'll have a really good new discovery also next year in um, Kandinsky of um, an early spiritual painter who was in Munich and who was forgotten, but it's, yeah, we'll have her. Um, and, um, and I think this lineage of spiritual female mediums ever since i mean we it's it's true we talked a lot about mondrian and kandinsky and and i still also have to say i really appreciate these artists it's not like you know i go like now there's hilma of clinton we should get, forget about them but i think there's an entire new lineage of me, mediumistic often female not always but often female painters that have been forgotten and now are back again and great shows, and Georgiana Houghton is probably the most prominent of them. Um, and she's also taken up, I think, I mean, it's on the one hand, it's as art history and institutions looking at that, but a lot is also being brought back through artists because they work with these artists, or some of them really for a long time already. Um, and I remember when Hilma Af Klint was, um, uh, when there was the big exhibition in 2013, there was someone in the MoMA who really sort of said, 
publicly that she shouldn't belong to the canon. And the next show was a show on contemporary painting in the MoMA, and she was all over in the catalog because all the artists are working with her. So I think also a big tribute should be given to the uh, to the artists to bring back all these beautiful works. Yeah, yeah. and in, uh, now I'm, I'm a little jet lagged, so I forgot. I mean, when uh, Ilma Klint was shown at PS1, the curator was. R.H. Quayman worked there. No. Uh, well, she helped bring that show uh, the there. It was, uh, it was the Ake Font show. Um, I will have to Google the artist. They actually completed the Rotonda display. R.H. Quayman. I can, I can, I can, oh, I can yeah, interject and confirm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I work at PS1. I can interject <laughs> yeah. and confirm it was Rebecca Quayman. Who yeah, Rebecca Quayman. Yeah, yeah. Show yeah. in 1989. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Her father, Harvey, had gone. Harvey so. lived in the muse, in the building next door. Ah, well, Harvey from next door. <laughs> uh, he saw the show and told her how excellent it was and it had to make sure that it came to New York. And so that was when the work first was shown in the U.S. in 1989, actually. Yeah, so it was... Uh, introduced by an artist, so yeah. that I think is quite... I think it's very important, and I think also, you know, when you talk about historicizing the work, there's ways that, you know, it's... All these artists are working of uh, ideas and visual culture of their time, and so even though they're not in direct dialogue, I do think that there is some sense in contextualizing one with the other, but I think in terms of historicizing it, there's also something very interesting, because the reception, which is also how we often talk about artists, doesn't really begin until the 1980s, and then it is this very unusual and like a planet comes in like a comet as well, you know, like kind of blows things up in ways that I think are really productive and interesting. And it makes for a kind of less linear way of thinking through how you construct that narrative, you know, how you pick your subject. And I think you talk about many art histories and you can make many from her. And I, I, but also to say in terms of putting things on their own terms, once again, to plug Julia's, Julia's book, book it, I think you do that very, very well to kind of put the work in the things that were important to her, the things that were informing her life. Um, I think you really do that beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> there were two, I think, maybe last questions. I appreciate your insistence, so they should be given a chance. <laughs> My insistence, but... Uh, oh, well. Thank you, Julia, for... Um, for sharing your knowledge here with us, and thanks, of course, today to interlocutors here that gave the podium to such an inspiring discussion today. Um, while looking at the painting, and I'm thinking now with a question of an art historian, I, I was not able not to see, actually, your first book on the drawing of Darwin. Because what, what we are looking here is actually systems of cosmological orders. We are looking at specific drawing that actually are looking us into the um, di diagram, sorry, they're using again this word, but a uh, word, but diagram of tree of knowledge and so on. Where do you stand now between Darwin and, and her? <laughs> I mean, for sure, I did my PhD on, the, on Charles Darwin's images, the ones he used for his research and the ones also he used in his books in order to spread evolutionary theory. Um, and th that was also, Ilma Afklin did a series which is called Evolution, um, and her understanding of evolution was something that Darwin would have not appreciated, um, was that there's not only a physical evolution, but also a spiritual evolution. So it's an ongoing thing, and it's transformative on all levels. But I think they're also, they have a lot in common. I mean, I think one important thing about Darwin is to understand that in order to... I mean, one way in order to make or his way of looking at nature was sort of upgrading small organisms um, rather than downgrading humans. Um, so he was talking about th there's a book on climbing plants, for example, by Charles Darwin, um, on the movements of plants, on earthworms and so forth. And he was always full of, pre uh, full of appreciate appreciation of these small organisms and their capacities to think, to move, to reason. And he would always try to find all aspects of humanity in, you know, the, the most humble organism. And I think this is something Hilma of Klint also does. So there, there, is, uh, there is a connection. <laughs> 
Stein or didn't believe in in evolution? Yeah. Oh yeah. Steiner did. Oh yeah. Thank you. Steiner was um, very much interested in Heckel. Yeah. Um, and then there was a point where Ernst Heckel, the German kind of Darwin, where Ernst Heckel sort of broke off the because he found him too spiritual. So, Julia, I thought you wrote a terrific book, and there was so much um, of interest in there. You mentioned that Hilma had something called the Fifth Gospel. I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's that's something she says, um, uh, and it's. Uh, I'm afraid a theologian would know more about it. I mean, for her, it's clear that her paintings are part, and this is pretty much also what you said, um, her Italy experience maybe, that her paintings are part of a bigger um, uh, worldview, religion, um, religious, spiritual system, although I would always be, um, be careful with the word system because it's not a rigid thing. It's something that needs to transform and that's not, that that's kind of unstoppable. And that's probably, that's her addition. If she calls it the new gospel, um, then um, it's something that is set in motion and should not stop transforming. Yeah. So she seemed to have her own cosmology, which we see by her images. And I don't know, you know what's in the 26,000 pages of writing, but there's probably a lot there. And it's interesting that right now there's this big movement in the psychedelic world and a lot of people I know had very deep interest in the show because of that world and so it's a really interesting time for science and psychology and nature and psychedelia, psychedelics and all of these things happening right now for her work to be more prominent and popular. Yeah and I mean there's also there's a lot of her starting point is definitely uh, Theosophy and Steiner and particularly in the writing, I mean, Dr. Steiner is all over. Um, and, the, you know, he, he dies uh, in the mid-20s. And um, as I said, during lifetime, he, he didn't put her down. And he, was, she show, he showed some interest, but it was a kind of distant um, relationship. But when he died, they become very close because then he also speaks to her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's in the notebooks, and they um, open... Uh, talking about wishful things? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a solution. <laughs> um, and then they also found a spiritual university together, where they both teach, and he also... That's where I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and he also uh, advises her with colors to choose, and so later on. So, yeah, posthumously, there's a great intensity. I think uh, that's a great ending. Sorry, I know that there are so many more questions, but thank you so much. <laughs>